Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony Painter. I'm Chief Research and Impact Officer um, at the RSA. I'd like to welcome you all to today's event from the RSA and Dust Progressive Zentrum. Uh, we're delighted to be partnering with DPZ once again as part of the 2021 Progressive Governance Digital Summit. Uh, it's a fantastic program of virtual events spanning several days um, at a critical moment for progressive thought, action, politics, post-pandemic and climate emergency and following on from important elections last year and with critical upcoming elections, not least in Germany this year and France next. So I do encourage you to take a look at what else is coming up in the programme this week. Now, I'm delighted to have the chance to talk today to Leah Greenberg, uh, joining us from Washington, D.C. Uh, Leah is co-founder and co-executive director of the Indivisible Project. It's a social movement organisation working to strengthen democracy by building progressive grassroots alliances. Uh, Leah previously worked as policy director for the Tom Periello, the governor for the Virginia campaign, and is author of We Are Indivisible, a Blueprint for Democracy After Trump. Leah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here today. See you. So let's start, um, not the beginning, but the beginning of the movement. Um, it would be you know, great, great if you could just sort of talk us through how you ended up here overseeing the exponential growth of, of a progressive political movement in the US, which is indivisible. Apparently it all started in a bar in Austin, Texas. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, so our story starts shortly after the election of Donald Trump. Um, I'm a former policy and uh, Hill staffer. My husband, Ezra, uh, was one as well. We had moved on from the Hill and were respectively working on poverty policy and human trafficking as of Donald Trump's election when like a lot of people in the country we suddenly got this uh very very big surprise um which was the election of trump and realized that everything that we worked on was going to be under assault in an incoming trump administration so we were looking for a way to have an impact we realized pretty early on that a lot of other people around the country were too we were getting added to these facebook groups by people who were suddenly resisting trump and we had this revelation uh, a couple of weeks after the election when we were in a bar in Austin with a friend who was managing a Facebook group called Dumbledore's Army, um, which is a, a reference to the underground group, um, underground pro pro justice uh, group within the um, uh, Harry Potter universe. And um, she was saying, you know, oh, I'm, I'm managing this group. It's got thousands of people in the Austin area. We're dedicated to fighting Donald Trump, but we're not really sure what to do. People are, you know, they're writing postcards and they're sending letters to Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, and they're, um, they feel like they're hitting a wall. They're not sure what they should be doing. Uh, we felt from our experiences as former Hill staffers that there were really important and valuable actions people could be taking and that we actually had a model for what that could look like. We'd seen it used against us a decade earlier in the form of the Tea Party, uh, which had been a very effective right wing social movement that organized locally uh, to blunt the impact of President Obama's agenda and ultimately deliver uh, the House and Senate to Republicans. Um, and we realized our contribution uh, could maybe just be taking the lessons that we had seen put into action by the Tea Party and turning them into a guide to congressional activism for everybody who was newly activated and looking to stop Donald Trump. Uh, so we did that. We wrote up a 23 page Google document. We put it on the internet in December of 2017. It was um, full of typos. We thought it was going to be read by our friends and maybe they would take it home to their families over the holiday break. And, you know, in six months, somebody would read it and let us know and say, hey, I used your guide at a town hall and it was great. And that would have been success. Um, instead, what happened was it went viral almost the first night. We were suddenly just overwhelmed with emails from all over the country, people who had been, you know, had been gathering together, who had started organizing themselves already, and who were now taking the Indivisible Guide and using it as the template for what they were going to do in their activism and taking the name Indivisible as their shared frame and their umbrella for organizing. Um, 
we were suddenly, you know, we were overwhelmed by people who were coming to us with follow-up questions too, right? Like, what do I do about, uh, what do we do about the Muslim ban? What are we doing to stop uh, the Trump attack on healthcare? How do I have an impact when my congressperson is a Democrat? How do I have an impact when they are a, uh, a Republican who is so far right that they won't even meet with us? Um, what do I do about the fact that the local paper wants to call, et cetera? Um, we realized we couldn't just put this on the internet and walk away. We needed to help uh, support this growing grassroots movement of people organizing all over the country. Um, that, you know, this was a missing ingredient that was really important, which was people getting active in their own communities, largely as volunteers, working to stop Trump, but also working at every level of government um, to affect positive progressive change. So we've been on that journey with the indivisible movement ever since then. Wow. I mean, j just while we're on the sort of biographical points, what were you planning to do had, you know, Indivisible not gone viral, viral in the way that it has and suddenly you had this organisation um, in, in, in your hands? Would you be a sort of congressional staffer again or? Well, I was managing a public-private partnership on human trafficking as of the election of Donald Trump, and I, you know, I went in the day after. Uh, it was it was a public-private partnership with the White House. Um, I went in the day after Trump was elected and told my boss, "I don't think we should have a partnership with the incoming Trump White House. Like, we can't we can't legitimize what they're going to do because they are going to create more human trafficking victims with their immigration policies, with their criminal justice policies, with their attacks on the social safety net." Let, let alone the fact that uh, Trump himself was a man who has been credibly accused of sexual assault by dozens of women. Um, so I, I have no idea what I would have been doing. I think I would have been within the human trafficking world, um, pulling my hair out as the, as the Trump administration made everything worse. Yeah, interesting, interesting. I mean, I've been sort of reading your stuff and listening to, to you know, some of your public appearance and so on. And from what you've been sort of articulating over the past few years, it, it seems to me that, that there are two main threats that you see. One is a sort of an assault on progressive values. And, and we'll come back to that in the conversation. And, and, and principally, there is also the sort of assault on democracy. And what what is the nature of the assault on democracy um, that that you see, and and how to the extent that it has has it been able to succeed? Yeah, I think we face two interlinked problems. Um, the first is that our institutions, quite simply, are they're outdated, they're structurally imbalanced to favor uh, wealthy white landowners from the very beginning, um, and they really aren't keeping pace with the problems that we face today. The second is that we are facing a coordinated, long-term right-wing assault on the functions of our democracy and our institutions. It's been going on for a long time. Um, it takes a number of different forms from attacks on labor rights and civil society and unions to gerrymandering, um, to voter suppression, to uh, efforts to capture the courts by radical right wing hacks. Um, it is a set of people who do not believe that uh, representative government will deliver for them the policy outcomes that they want, which is uh, the capture and continued control of resources by a small, rich white elite. Um, and who have systematically dedicated themselves to undermining democracy as a result. That was already in motion before Donald Trump was elected. What Donald Trump did was he drew on some of the same currents that these folks were using in order to power their agendas, uh, you know, and, uh, the deep current of racism that is uh, prominent within American society, turbocharged it, you know, really pulled out, uh, so it took all the parts that people used to say quietly and said them out loud, um, and really just sort of further exacerbated this ongoing schism within American society that is itself turning, it is itself part of the um, fueling the attack on our institutions. So right now we're facing this basic challenge. We have a significant segment of American society that has turned against the very idea of democracy itself if they cannot maintain control. Um, powered by and you know fueled by a a coordinated right wing plan to do so. So all of the right wing institutions that we see that have been active over the last several decades, they're actively trying now to propagate an agenda of voter suppression, of gerrymandering, of court packing um, where they can, which is in the states. 
Yeah, it's interesting. And yeah, of course, of course, historically, as you say, the institutions that started out were imbalanced to, to, to begin with. Obviously, the debate about well, the, the long-standing debate and the current debates about filibuster and things like that are obviously um, uh, uh, part of that. And the, the way that you know certain demographics have and certain interests have a have a, a, a structural advantage. I, I guess what's interesting in the in the US and beyond, you know, in quite a few sort of European environments is the the willingness, if you write, of particularly the sort of populist right, I guess mm-hmm. is how you might describe it, to not just just win um within the rules of the game, but to really bend the rules of the game. You see it in Hungary and Poland, probably to a lesser extent in the UK um, uh, as well. It's kind of easy to say Brexit is part of that of that process. But I think you can see that as you know a, a legitimate debate in 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 some respects. But we're starting to see some of that sort of subtle voter suppression starting to come into our own sort of legis- um, legislative um, debate. But there, something turns, doesn't it, in the last sort of 10 or 20 years where there was an increasing willingness to bend the rules, not just win under the rules. It, and that must be something you've seen. And what, what do you think turns that? Is it is it particular personalities, leadership, or is it a sense of uh, a risk of political loss? And so you have to start to play a bit unfairly and break free of the sort of, into a sort of no holds barred environment. I think I think it's a little bit of all of the above, right? It's this global right our rise of right wing uh, white nationalism of illiberalism. It's fueled in many places by a sense that um, a you know folks who considered themselves to be in the minority, both politically and our majority, both politically and culturally, for a long time, are now facing increasingly diverse, increasingly pluralistic societies. Um, and are reacting to that by trying to maintain and uh, maintain power and change the rules in order to maintain power. Um, I think you see that differently in different societies, but it's absolutely um, a common thread. I think it's fueled as well by uh, a collapse in faith in elites um, that has been a long time coming in many ways. Uh, it's the product uh, in our a case of uh, elites getting us into the Iraq war, um, of them failing to respond to the Great Recession with the scope of the solutions that were necessary, um, of a general and long term deprioritization of, uh, you know, class politics that would actually have um, offered a meaningful alternative. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's that's not necessarily exactly the same in every country, but I do think the combination of a, a sense, um, a sense of threat, a sense that um, people, people who have long held outsized cultural and political power are no longer uh, no longer in that position or are, are seeing that power fade is fueling people's willingness to uh, operate, not just within the rules, but outside of them. It's interesting, isn't it? Because that, that, that charge of sort of, if you like, um, uh, elite sort of running the system in their own interests, uh, you, you can't help but notice that representative democracies were open to that charge. There's no, there's no doubt about that. And when you look at the sort of institutions that uphold pluralism, um, uh, human rights, um, and representative government, there's no doubt that there's there's a sense that those institutions have become elitist, and um, even if their purpose was to uphold liberal democratic um, uh, values, the, the 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 charge is not all a false one, is it? I think we have to hold a couple of things in our heads at the same time here. Um, one is that uh, it is important to be defending our democratic institutions, and the other is that the institutions haven't worked for everyone historically, and the elites who have run them in many cases have screwed up in serious ways. Um, You know, from the Iraq war to the Great Recession, there are reasons why people have less faith in the existing class of folks who managed managed our institutions. One of the very common things that we hear from folks across Indivisible um, who got involved in 2017 is you know, I I thought somebody else was I thought somebody else was handling this, right? I thought that something about our existing institutions, whether it was the media or the parties or the courts or whatever, would prevent the election of a guy like Donald Trump, who is so obviously unsuited for the office. And you know, having realized that that didn't happen, uh, I needed to get involved. And so, you know, we see ourselves as a social movement within a broader set of waves of social movements of people who 
took the power into their own hands, recognizing that the state had failed them. Um, and that's, you know, that goes back to the dreamers, um, the folks who fought for uh, immigration status under President Obama to occupy, to Black Lives Matter. These are folks who are um, coping with failing systems by turning to the power of social movements. And you can completely understand the reaction. I mean, you know, just, just reflecting on the, uh, the aftermath of the murder of George um, Floyd, which, by the way, was a global response in the end. I think it took everybody by surprise. We thought, here we go again. There's another unlawful killing at the hands of a law enforcement officer in the US. This is just, you know, what happens in in in, in the US. And before we knew it, the, you know, the the, the fire of, of of rightful anger had 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 caught on across the whole whole globe um, in many respects. But you can see, you know, some of the reactions to that starts with things like, you know, talking about law enforcement, sort of defund the police and so on. And I wonder how arguments like that sort of play into sort of progressive thinking um, ultimately. Are they, are, are, are they just very sort of strong challenges to the system that shine a very bright light on injustice? Or might they be counterproductive because they, they they start to create a sort of situation of recall around many of the people that progressives need to persuade in order to remain in power over the, the, the longer term? Well, I think that we are, I think we've entered a period of time where there's a lot more honesty about the role that race has always played in our politics. Um, when we talk about, you know, how our institutions came to where we are, um, one of the things we talk about is the post-civil rights movement realignment of the political parties, where previously you had two political parties that were able to sustain some concept of bipartisan uh, compromise, in part because each of them had a series of internal ideological schisms that were the product of um, basically the Civil War, of having Southern segregationist factions. Um, uh, you know, they were ideologically all over the place in part because um, they were founded not on a clear set of ideological commitments, but on the regional politics that developed post-Civil War. At, in the following, following the civil rights movement, right. that sorted itself out. Democrats, as uh, in the words of LBJ, lost the South for a generation, increasingly lost the um, Southern segregationist wing of their own party. Republicans took those folks on. The parties moved in such a direction that there wasn't really that foundation for compromise anymore. And that was not a that was a not a bad thing because ultimately what it reflected was the enfranchisement of a lot of people who had not previously been in the room. Um, and so, you know, recognizing that the bipartisanship and like that lost golden era was actually fundamentally founded on the exclusion of people of color and specifically black folks from the political compact uh, in this country. And that a lot of the stresses we are seeing on our institutions right now are the product of backlash to a greater era of representation and reflection. So fundamentally, there's not a way around having serious conversations about the role that race has played in our country, um, the role that uh, law enforcement has played in protecting a, uh, a dominant white elite. I think that we should recognize that um, Republicans have for a really long time made a pretty foundational um, part of their political strategy instead of delivering for people on the policy front, distracting them with um, racism, xenophobia, and divisive attacks. And, you know, one of the deepest wells that they have drawn on is anti-Black racism. Um, you see this not just with uh, their, you know, their um, attacks around defund the police, but uh, much more dramatically right now with their attack on critical race theory, um, which they use as essentially a proxy for anything related to race in education, in public life, um, this is not a, uh, this is a moment when we actually have to be really honest about the role that race is playing in our politics. And, you know, that is uncomfortable for folks because a lot of times we have not had those conversations and they can be challenging for people who are not used to having conversations about race, which is to say mostly white people. Uh, and also we're not going to get through this if we're not real about what got us here. Yeah. What's interesting, of course, is that President Biden, I, I kind of read as a, as a sort of natural born compromiser, but he doesn't feel able to operate in that way. Probably seeing what happened to Obama, who obviously uh, uh, approached his administration in that way. And the fact that the Biden clearly is leaving the door open, but clearly realizes he has to operate um, in a way that assumes he's not going to get cooperation 
if he's going to get anywhere. And, and his willingness to do that, I think, has enabled him to make 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 strides. And um, I want to come on to this sort of notion around sort of um, uh, th this this sort of notion of progressive, because it's 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 come back into fashion again, really interestingly. Um, now, of course, there's sort of early um so 20th century version of progressivism teddy roosevelt and so on progressive party progressive movement very powerful historically defining force flawed as you know any sort of politics in the early 20th century inevitably was but kind of had its heyday if you like from the very late 19th century obviously to the to, to the um the franklin roosevelt um administrations and, and then it kind of over time sort of lost its force and then became sort of taken as a sort of synonym, probably under the sort of Clinton um, era, the Blair era, the Schroeder, Schroeder era in, in, in Germany, as, as just a way of describing sort of moderation and incremental change rather than rather than radicalism. But what's really interesting is it seems to have gathered force as, 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 as a sort of a, a program of radical change, or at least a movement of radical change, or at least a way of thinking of, of radical change. Is, is that kind of how you see the evolution of sort of progressive values? And do you see them now having the sort of force that they had in the US context, the same sort of force that they had in the early 20th century? You know, that's interesting. I, I would divorce the evolution of this moment politically from necessarily the word progressive. Um, I think when we talk about progressive in this country, a lot of times what we're talking about is um, a wing, a wing of or a current of thought that is in favor of um, structural reform and redistribution of power, power and resources. Um, yeah. I think that has been a rising current uh, within and outside the Democratic Party over the last decade, um, in part reflecting a response to, um, you know, the places where there's broad agreement that we did not go far enough during um, the, pre the Obama term or the Obama years. Um, obviously, you know, the, the Sanders campaign of 2016 played an enormous role in creating an umbrella and an organizing foundation that um, a huge amount of the, the um, institutions and the, uh, obviously the Bernie Sanders campaign played an enormous role in galvanizing um, this resurgent, you know, movement under the umbrella of progressivism. Um, I think that what we have seen pretty consistently at this stage is there's also just a rejection of some of the uh, false, some of the false ideas or false narratives um, that constrained us during the Obama years. Um, so you see this with the discourse around the deficit, where during President Obama's term, um, there was a major push by the right wing and a lot of institutional centrist actors around um, a concern around the debt and the deficit and the impact that was having on the economy. Much of President Obama's two terms in office were taken up by discourse about how are we gonna reduce the debt instead of how are we gonna change people's lives for the better. There has been a consensus among a whole set of actors within the Democratic Party that that is not the right question to ask. That is not the right frame for the conversations we need to have right now. We need to have conversations about how we deliver for people and how we ultimately do that in a way that um, shifts the balance of power between, for example, workers and employers, um, between uh, electeds and their voters. Um, those are the kinds of conversations that have come out of this resurgence around progressivism. Yeah, it's interesting, and, and you, you're right, of course, that the that the moderate progressives lost that argument, um, and obviously in the last year or so, it's been even more spectacular because the limits to which um, the deficit and debts can be pushed are even greater magnitude in some respects in the response to the, um, the, the 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 financial financial crash, and I think there's. There became a sort of way of thinking, I think, on on the progressive side of politics in the sort of 90s and 2000s was that you, you had to get as close to the sort of median voter as possible. Mm -hmm. And you had to sort of pursue that magical center point, which of course doesn't, doesn't really exist, as opposed to politics being a sort of set of different sort of value sets that, 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 that can surge and come together in new and radically very different ways with different types of leadership. And it, 
is that how you see sort of how politics evolved as a sort of set of sort of values that can that can swirl and dynamically develop rather than a sort of static picture of sort of positioning and if you get the positioning right you, you'll, mo you'll mop up a, as much volume as possible well i i would i'd take a step back i'd say i think that um there has also been a a, a more a broader strategic recognition um among a lot of folks on our side of the aisle that uh, you have to adapt how you approach politics in a period when there is no good faith governing partner in the other side. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, I think part of the collapse around the deficit reflects the really um, ridiculous context that just happened in the last 10 years, right? Which is President Obama dedicated an enormous amount of time and political capital to trying to tame the deficit. President Trump came in and immediately gave a budget busting tax cut to the top 1%. Um, in that case, uh, I think a lot of people recognize that there is not much point in having Democrats continually come in and be the party of take your medicine when Republicans are just going to immediately go and you know raid the uh, candy drawer. Um, there's also a shift from sort of the the tendency to look at what people say they want in a poll and try to deliver that versus a basic holistic framework around can we make people's lives better. And will they reward us for that? Um, I think the deficit is a great example of this. When people talk about the deficit, they were never actually talking about the debt. They were talking about, uh, you know, it was a proxy for the different fights around values that they were having. Um, people were saying, um, I am worried about the deficit when they were actually worried that the government was giving too much money for black to black and brown communities. So it wasn't just another form of dog whistle politics. On our side, I think there's just been a recognition that the simplest and best thing we can do is deliver tangible change for people as quickly as possible and as directly linked to our governance as possible. Um, I think back to the, uh, again, to the early Obama years when the, the economists in the White House designed a stimulus package that was actually intentionally structured so that people wouldn't notice that they had gotten more money. Um, and that was based on the best and most, you know, the, the, the best science and the best uh, studies of behavioral science out there, which was people are more likely to spend this if we don't tell them that it's extra, otherwise they might save it. Great idea and also terrible politics. Nobody knew that they had benefited from President Obama passing a stimulus package that had put more money in their pockets. We need to do a really simple job of making people's lives better and then telling them that we made their lives better. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. The Democrats do that. The Biden administration does that. Um, does that sort of quell the sort of probability that there's going to be an electoral backlash? And then what does the backlash look like in that in that case? Does the Republican Party finally reform itself? You described it as a sort of, you know, a, a bad faith uh, uh, opponent. You know, they could go into even more extreme territory, terrifyingly. Um, or does there become a point of realization actually that there have to be limits and parameters to this? You can't deny the results of elections. You can't actually base your future on trying to deny people the ability to uh, uh, vote, particular, um, particularly particular communities um, who you will cut off um, from your institution uh, forevermore. And actually you are starting to associate some, with some very scary elements in, in, in society. Does the backlash sort of intensify? Does it work? Or does the Republican, real, Republican Party realize that it can't go on like this? I would say the backlash is already here. And unfortunately, they can do all of those things. Um, the Republican Party has a uh, minority of voters, but they happen to be incredibly well represented in places that are structurally advantaged by our political system which allows them to maintain a level of control within, for example, the Senate that they shouldn't be able to have based on their numerical strength alone. Um, there is also quite simply no, there is no evidence that we can see on the horizon that the Republican party has reached rock bottom, will reach rock bottom, is going to reform or fix itself. Um, it remains firmly in the control of Donald Trump. What we've seen over the last couple of months has been the continued purging of anybody who does not fall in line behind his assertions that the 2020 election was stolen and the very conscious and intentional setting up of an infrastructure in the states that can suppress votes, that can gerrymander both 
uh, congressional and state legislative districts, once again, that um, may well put in place folks who can literally just overturn electoral results, whether or not uh, they have any grounds to do so. That's all reinforced by a right wing judiciary that is packed with Donald Trump appointees. It's not just the Supreme Court. It's a, a lot of uh, mid and uh, lower level courts as well. Um, we are in a very dangerous spiral in which the Republican Party in no way needs to moderate to continue to hold power because they control a set of institutions and they are overrepresented in key places. Um, and they can use those two things to their advantage in order to maintain essentially minority rule uh, and they're setting up to do so. So the backlash is here, it's on its way without major structural federal reform. We are in a very dangerous cycle in which illiberal actions in the states are reinforced by a right-wing judiciary and that is that is a doom loop. So, I mean, the, the strategy is a clear one, isn't it? You have to politically outmuscle them. You have to, you have to, Use your power where, 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 where you can to demonstrate the difference you can make to people's lives, to mobilize people uh, en masse, to resist that institutional capture, as we've seen in places like Georgia, for example. That's, that's, a, that's a blueprint, isn't it, for, for, for how to win this next decade? Well, I, I would point to Georgia as also the place where, the, where you see the limits of simply... Uh, you know, of, of, a, of the strategy, right? Um, there has been extraordinary work done in Georgia to organize, to um, build the kind of political power that is capable of winning statewide. It is incredible. It's a huge credit to Stacey Abrams and her vision. Um, we also have a continued Republican right-wing gerrymandered state legislature, and they have gerrymandered it enormously effectively such that even in times when Democrats win statewide, um, they do not win the state legislature. And the state legislature continues to pass terrifyingly right-wing regressive bills. Um, they have moved one of the most dramatic voter suppression piece legislation. Uh, they moved one of the most dramatic pieces of voter suppression legislation that we have seen in this country. Um, they've had similar attacks on trans youth, on a woman's right to choose, on a whole set of social values. Um, you know, what we have seen is, unless we actually address structurally the ways in which Republicans have subverted the rules, um, we are going to be stuck in this doom loop. And that's why federal structural reform is so crucial. We have to actually go at gerrymandering. We have to actually address the level of voter suppression that Republicans are trying to propagate around the country. Um, we have to make our elections fair, more repre representative, and our political systems more inclusive. And if we don't do that, then we are going to be stuck watching Republicans use the power they have in the states in order to maintain the control, a, a stranglehold on our political system. So in some respects, the next midterm elections are the most important elections of all, because those are the ones that are gonna grant the ability to do that, to potentially see that structural reform as long as this, this democratic surge can, can, can increase? Well, I would say that, um, you know, every election is the most important election of our lives, right? Um, the 2020 election delivered Democrats a trifecta in Washington. We ought to be able to make change right now. Um, we need to do the kinds of things that would cause people to believe that a democratic majority makes their life better. And we also need to address these structural reforms right now before the 2022 election, because otherwise we are going to be playing on ground that Republicans have prepared in a bunch of key states, right? They have passed enormously restrictive voter suppression bills in Georgia, in Florida, in Texas, in Arizona. They're trying to do it places where it doesn't even make sense, like Iowa. Um, you know, Republicans are not are not in any danger of losing their majorities in Iowa. Um, we are facing a enormously dangerous rising illiberal force. Um, and if we don't make those structural reforms, then we're going to be heading into 2022 at a massive disadvantage, in addition to the disadvantage one usually faces as a president um, who generally loses seats in the midterms. And there's a real risk that the losses in 2022 set us up for a 2024 in which key states for the Electoral College are in the control of Republicans. And there's simply no reason based on the current context of the Republican Party to believe that those folks would respect a state going for President Biden. 
So we are in an enormously dangerous situation and without reform and immediate action at the federal level, there's just no reason to believe we're ever gonna have an uncontested election again. So the, 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 the rise of the liberal forces, as you, as you describe it clearly, that, that, that's a motivating, motivating and mobilizing force in and of itself. Now, what, what else is gonna mobilize people um, in sufficient numbers to, 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 to resist this, this sort of structural um, catastrophe. Climate emergency, we had, I had Michael Tubbs on, on guaranteed um, um, income a few weeks ago, you know, is, is it about sort of, you know, a better distribution, better cash support to people? What, what are the issues that are really going to motivate and mobilise the majority? Because it needs to be huge numbers. Well, I think when we're talking about what's going to motivate the majority, we're talking about a bunch of different sets of folks. Um, I do think that it is absolutely crucial and imperative that we take action on climate in advance of the 2022 election. That is a key promise to um, the base. It is a key promise to uh, a set of constituents who, you know, to, to our folks who knocked doors, who did uh, the legwork of de delivering a Democratic majority in 2018 and 2020. Um, I also think fundamentally the Democrats are going to need to run with a very clear narrative of your life is better now under democratic governance than it was under Donald Trump. Um, the, the American Rescue Plan had a very simple uh, motto of shots in arms and checks in pockets, um, which was, you know, that works, right? Like you have more money now, there are vaccinated. Uh, people vaccinated now. Um, your life is returning to normal by 2022. Your kids are back in school during the day. Um, you know, there's there's a very simple story that we can tell, which is irresponsible Republican governance and responsible, caring Democratic governance. Um, that's dependent on continuing to deliver for people. So right now there's a debate around a major infrastructure package. Um, and what could be included, uh, whether that is um, roads or whether that is things like care, care, uh, care funding, right? Um, we yeah. are a country with basically no social support system for parents and caregivers. Um, it is an enormous challenge. It could have the potential to make an enormous difference in people's lives. This is the kind of thing that we can point to when we actually run and say, you know, this is the difference between Democratic and Republican governance is you're actually like you're not on your own in taking care of your two year old anymore. That's a really big deal. These are the kinds of things we should do. Like when you have a trifecta, it's important to move fast and it's important to um, go big and bold. And, you know, that is that is the moment that we are in with Democrats. And so we just need to see them do that move fast and fix things and it seems to me that you know indivisible is is kind of tailor-made for this moment so as you as i'm listening to to describing the, the, the political challenge i'm thinking well this needs a it's enormous reserves of energy it seems you're able to mobilize in that way it's going to be messy it's mm -hmm. going to be local it's going to be pluralistic it's going to have lots of different sort of touch points in in different ways but also there has to be some sort of coming together as a sense of sort of common values and sense of sense of mission and it, it it seems to me that somehow indivisible has managed to get into that that space so it's a critical part of the political infrastructure we've got. Well, we've tried to build up an organization that's capable of both supporting local indivisible groups all over the country, which are, you know, they were volunteer led, they are local, they are independent, um, they decide what they are going to focus on. A lot of times they are running their own campaigns, um, putting people into office, doing the things they do best. And uh, what we try to do is create a, um, a, center of gravity, a, strat a shared set of strategic campaigns that folks can throw into such that uh, we as a movement are greater than the sum of our parts when it comes to federal policy in Washington, DC. So um, we build and develop the kind of uh, strategies that allow everyone to play in, um, to you know understand where they fit, right? When we're having a fight for something like right now, um, a major democracy reform bill, um, here's what we need from you. If you are in a state with a democratic senator, hey, you're in a state with Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, here is where the strategy is and what we need you to help with. Um, here's how we all together can get this bill done. So that's the work that we are doing right now and engaged in right now. Um, it is trying to translate um, the beautiful the beautiful um, local organizing efforts that are 
all over the country into a cohesive national voice and demand for reform. Um, it is it is a uh, fascinating moment to be doing that. We're moving from resistance to a period when we can actually get things done, which is uh, a whole new set of muscles to work and also incredibly exciting. This has resonance on the global level as well, of course. You know, we, we, we've got the, the G7 coming up. The finance ministers over the weekend came to, you know, a, what, what seems to be a pretty historic agreement, actually, to coordinate on, on minimum corporation tax levels. You know, you can gripe and say, well, it's only uh, 15%, but it seems pretty significant as a, as a mechanism to me and something that can be um, built on. We've got COP26 coming up towards the end of the year um, in, in uh, Glasgow, um, here in, uh, in the UK. Um, and, you know, your, your sort of method of change, if you like, this sort of bringing together of disparate, uh, disparate um, uh, highly energized, but, you know, issue and community driven groups that, that come together over, over the long haul. That seems to me to offer something um, as, 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 as a pointer um, for global civil society as we think to sort of engage with these big global um, issues, regulatory changes, global agreements that always feel incredibly distant. Absolutely. Um, I think that there is more that we could be doing to, you know, to crystallize what is the shared strategy that we are all, that we're all tying into, what is the umbrella um, of values of core demands that ultimately unite us across uh, civil societies. Um, right now, and for us, it is absolutely, you know, how are we, how are we all dealing with this rise of right-wing populism, uh, white nationalism, liberalism, whatever you want to call it, or however, how it manifests in um, each place. How are we dealing with this essential challenge to um, the concepts of multiracial pluralistic dem democracy? Um, and how are we supporting each other in doing so? Brilliant. Well, we're coming to the end of our conversation now but it feels feels too soon um but but nonetheless we are we are beginning to run out of time and we're asking all the sort of speakers and contributors at the progressive government summit to ask um one simple question so i'm going to pose it to you Leah, if that's that's okay and it's just very briefly you know can you give us your one big idea for how progressives can ensure that citizens voices are heard and translated into political action in the 2020s we need to prioritize structural reforms that secure our democratic institutions that make them fair, more representative and more inclusive so that we can actually translate um, the energy that we have into meaningful political change and then we can sustain it. Right. Brilliant. A great note to end on. And, and um, I think it's clear from our conversation there are enormous possibilities ahead but some very significant and sometimes somehow scary challenges, actually. So um, but that is all we've got time for. And Leah, thank you so much for talking to us and sharing your insights from your work empowering civil society actors to strengthen democracy for themselves. And to those of you watching, I, I do encourage you to find out more about Leah's brilliant work with the Indivisible Project. It really is a hopeful and effective project working across all the US. Um, and we'll expect to see exciting things from them in the years to come. And who knows, even beyond the borders of the US itself. Um, and I just a reminder that this event is taking place as part of the 2021 Progressive Governance Digital Summit, hosted by DAS Progressive Zentrum, uh, their longtime friends and partners of the RSA. And um, so do have a look at the other events they're hosting this week. Um, and all that's left for me is to say thank you again to Leah Greenberg and thank you all for watching. Thank you.